impact the 16 environmental issues. Human population size has grown enormously over the last 100 years. This means increase in the demand for food, water, home, electricity, roads, automobiles and numerous other commodities. These demands are exerting tremendous pressure on our natural resources and are also contributing to pollution of air, water and soil. The need of the hover is to check the degradation and depletion of our precious natural resources and pollution without halting the process of development. Pollution is any undesirable change in physical, chemical or biological characteristics of air, land, water or soil. Agents that bring about such an undesirable change are called as pollutants. In order to control the environmental pollution, the Government of India has passed the Environment Protection Act 1986 to protect and improve the quality of our environment, air, water and soil. Air pollution and its control. We are dependent on air for our respiratory needs. Air pollutants cause injury to all living organisms. They reduce the growth and yield of the crops and cause premature death of the plants. Air pollutants also deleteriously affect the respiratory system of humans and of animals. Harmful effects depend on the concentration of the pollutants, duration of exposure and the organism. Smoke stacks of thermal power plants, smelters and other industries release the particulate and gaseous air pollutants together with harmless gases such as nitrogen, oxygen etc. These pollutants must be separated or filtered out before releasing the harmless gases into the atmosphere. There are several ways of removing the particulate matter, the most widely used of which is the electrostatic precipitator. Figure 16.1 shows the electrostatic precipitator which can remove more than 99% of the particulate matter present in the exhaust from a thermal power plant. It has electrode wires that are maintained at several thousand volts, which produce a corona that releases the electrons. These electrons attach to the dust particles giving them a net negative charge. The collecting plates are grounded and attract the charged or dust particles. The velocity of air between the plates must be low enough to allow the dust to fall. A scrubber can remove the gases like sulfur dioxide. In a scrubber, the exhaust is passed through a spray of water or lime. Recently, we have realized the dangers of particulate matter that are very very small and are not removed by these precipitators. According to the Central Pollution Control Board, CPCB, particulate size 2.5 micrometers or less in diameter are responsible for causing the greatest harm to the human health. These fine particulates can be inhaled deep into the lungs and can cause breathing and respiratory symptoms irritation, inflammations and damage to the lungs and premature deaths. Automobiles are a major cause for atmospheric pollution, at least in the metro cities. As the number of vehicles increases on the street, this problem is now shifting to the other cities too. Proper maintenance of the automobiles along with the use of lead-free petrol or diesel can reduce the pollutants they emit. Catalytic converters having expensive metals namely platinum, palladium and rhodium as the catalyst are fitted into automobiles for reducing the emission of the poisonous gases. As the exhaust passes through the catalytic converter, unburnt hydrocarbons are converted into carbon dioxide and water and the carbon monoxide and nitric oxide are changed to carbon dioxide and nitrogen gas respectively. Motor vehicles equipped with catalytical converter should use unleaded petrol because lead in the petrol inactivates the catalyst. In India, the Air Prevention and Control of Pollution Act came into force in 1981 but was amended in 1987 to include noise as an air pollutant. Noise is undesired high level of sound. We have got used to associating loud sounds with pleasure and entertainment, not realizing that noise causes psychological and physiological disorders in humans. The bigger the city, the bigger the function, the greater the noise. A brief exposure to extremely high sound level, 150 decibels or more generated by takeoff of a jet plane or rocket may damage the eardrums, thus permanently impairing the hearing ability. Even chronic exposure to a relatively lower noise levels of cities may permanently damage the hearing abilities of humans. Noise also causes sleeplessness, increased heartbeat, altered breathing pattern, thus considerably stressing humans. Considering the many dangerous effects of noise pollution, you can identify the unnecessary sources of noise pollution around you, which can be reduced immediately without any financial loss to anybody. 
Reduction of noise in our industries can be affected by use of sound absorbent materials or by muffling noise. Stringent following of laws laid down in relation to noise like delimita delimitation of horn-free zones around hospitals and schools, permissible sound levels of crackers and of loudspeakers, timings after which loudspeakers cannot be played etc. need to be enforced to protect ourselves from noise pollution. Controlling Vehicular Air Pollution, a case study of Delhi with its very large population of vehicular traffic, Delhi leads the country in its levels of air pollution. It has more cars than the states of Gujarat and West Bengal put together. In the 1990s, Delhi ranked fourth among the 41 most polluted cities of the world. Air pollution problems in Delhi became so serious that a public interest litigation PIL was filed in the Supreme Court of India. After being censured very strongly by the Supreme Court under its directives, the government was asked to take, within a specified time period, appropriate measures including switching over the entire fleet of public transport, that is, buses from diesel to compressed natural gas CNG. All the buses of the Delhi were converted to run on the CNG by the end of 2002. You may ask the question as to why CNG is better than diesel. The answer is that CNG burns most efficiently unlike petrol or diesel in the automobiles and very little of it is left unburnt. Moreover, CNG is cheaper than petrol or diesel, cannot be siphoned off by thieves and adulterated like petrol or diesel. The main problem with switching over to CNG is the difficulty of laying down, down pipelines to deliver the CNG through distribution points or pumps and ensuring uninterrupted supply. Simultaneously, parallel steps taken in Delhi for reducing the vehicular pollution include phasing out of old vehicles, use of unleaded petrol, use of low sulfur petrol and diesel, use of catalytic converters in vehicles, application of stringent pollution level norms for vehicles, etc. The Government of India, through a new auto fuel policy, has laid out a roadmap to cut down the vehicular pollution in Indian cities. More stringent norms for fuel mean steadily reducing the sulphur and aromatic content in petrol and diesel fuels. Euro 3 norms, for example, stipulate that sulphur be controlled at 350 parts per million ppm in diesel and 150 parts per million in petrol. Aromatic hydrocarbons are to be contained at 42% of the concerned fuel. The goal, according to the roadmap, is to reduce the sulphur to 50 ppm in petrol and diesel and bring down the level to 35%. Corresponding to the fuel, vehicle engines also need to be upgraded. Mass emission standard Bharat Stage 2, which is equivalent to Euro 2 norms, are no more applicable in any of the cities of India. Details of the latest mass emission standards in India are provided below. Table 16.1 Table showing the mass emission standards in India Thanks to the efforts made, the air quality of Delhi has significantly improved. According to an estimate, a substantial fall in carbon dioxide and sulfur dioxide level has been found in Delhi between 1997 and 2005. Water pollution and its control Human beings have been abusing the water bodies around the world by disposing into them all kinds of waste. We tend to believe that water can wash away everything, not taking cognizance of the fact that water bodies are our lifeline as well as that of other living organisms. Can you list what all we tend to try and wash away through our rivers and drains? Due to such activities of the humankind, the ponds, lakes, streams rivers and estuaries and oceans are becoming polluted in several parts of the world. Realizing the importance of maintaining the cleanliness of water bodies, the Government of India has passed the Water Prevention and Control of Pollution Act 1974 to safeguard our water resources. Domestic Seawage and Industrial Effluence As we work with water in our homes in the cities and towns, we wash everything into drains. Have you ever wondered where the seawage that comes out of our houses go? What happens in villages? Is the seawage treated before being transported to the nearest river and mixed with it? A mere 0.1% impurities make the domestic seawage unfit for human use. Figure 16.2 The Composition of Wastewater those impurities constitute 0.1% and water constitutes 99.9%. Among the impurities, we have suspended particles, example the sand, silt and clay. Colloidal material, example fecal matter, bacteria, cloth and paper fibers. 
and dissolved materials example nutrients like nitrate ammonia phosphate sodium and calcium you have read about sewage treatment plants in chapter 10 solids are relatively easy to remember remove what is difficult to remove are the dissolved salts such as nitrates phosphates and other nutrients and the toxic metal ions and organic compounds domestic sewage generally contains biodegradable organic matter which readily decomposes thanks to the bacteria and other microorganisms which can multiply using these organic substances as substrates and hence utilize some of the components of the sewage it is possible to estimate the amount of the biodegradable organic matter in sewage water by measuring the biochemical oxygen demand the bod can you explain how in the chapter on microorganisms you have read about the relationship between the bod microorganisms and the amount of biodegradable matter figure 16.3 shows some of the changes that once may notice following discharge of the sewage into water microorganisms involved in biodegradation of the organic matter in the receiving water body consume a lot of oxygen and as a result there is sharp decline in the dissolved oxygen downstream from the point of sewage discharge this causes mortality of the fish and other aquatic creatures presence of large amounts of nutrients in water also causes excessive growth of the planktonic free floating algae called an algal bloom which imparts a distinct color to the water bodies algal blooms causes deteriorated deterioration of the water quality and fish mortality some bloom forming algae are extremely toxic to the human beings and the animals you may have seen the beautiful mauve colored flowers found on very appealingly shaped floating plants in water bodies these plants which were introduced into india for their lovely flowers have caused havoc by their excessive growth by causing blocks in our waterways they grow faster than our ability to remove them these are plants of water hyacinth iconia crassips the world's most problematic aquatic weed also known as the terror of bengal they grow abundantly in eutrophic water bodies and lead to an imbalance in the ecosystem dynamics of the water body sewage from our homes as well as from the hospitals are likely to contain many undesirable pathogenic microorganisms and its disposal into water without proper treatment may cause outbreak of serious diseases such as dysentery typhoid jaundice cholera etc Unlike domestic sewage waste water from industries like petroleum paper manufacturing metal extraction and processing chemical manufacturing etc often contain toxic substances notably heavy metals defined as elements with density greater than 5 g per cm3 such as mercury cadmium copper lead etc and a variety of organic compounds A few toxic substances often present in industrial waste water can undergo biological magnification biomagnification in the aquatic food chain Biomagnification refers to increase in the concentration of the toxicant at successive trophic levels this happens because a top because a toxic substance accumulated by an organism cannot be metabolized or excreted and is thus passed on to the next higher trophic level this phenomenon is well known for mercury and ddt figure 16.5 shows biomagnification of the ddt in an aquatic food chain in this manner the concentration of ddt is increased at successive trophic levels say if it starts at 0.03 ppb parts per billion in water it can ultimately reach 25 ppm parts per million in fish eating birds through biomagnification high concentrations of ddt disturb the calcium metabolism in birds which causes thinning of the eggshell and their premature breaking eventually causing decline in the bird populations eutrophication is the natural aging of the lake by nutrient enrichment of its water in a young lake the water is cold and clear supporting little life with time streams draining into the lake introduce nutrients such as nitrogen and phosphorus which encourage the growth of the aquatic organisms as the lake's fertility increases plant and animal life burgeons and organic remains begin begins to be deposited on the lake bottom over the centuries as silt and organic debris pile up the lake grey grows shallower and warmer with warmer water organisms supplanting those that thrive in the cold environment marsh plants take roots in the shallows and begin to fill in the original lake basin
Eventually, the lake gives way to large masses of floating plants, bark, finally converting into land. Depending on climate, size, and other factors, the natural aging of the lake may span thousands of years. However, pollutants from the man's activity, like effluents from the industries and homes, can radically accelerate the aging process. This phenomenon has been called the cultural or the accelerated eutrophication. During the past century, lakes in many parts of the earth have been severely eutrophied by sewage and agricultural and industrial waste. The primary contaminants are nitrates and phosphates, which act as plant nutrients. They overstimulate the growth of algae, causing unsightly scum and unpleasant odors, and robbing the water of dissolved oxygen vital to other aquatic life. At the same time, other pollutants flowing into the lake may poison whole populations of the fish, whose decomposing remains further deplete the water's dissolved oxygen content. In such fashion, a lake can literally choke to death. Heated thermal waste waters flowing out of electricity generating units, example the thermal power plants, constitute another important category of the pollutants. Thermal waste water eliminates or reduces the number of organisms sensitive to high temperature and may enhance the growth of plants and fish in extremely cold areas, but only after causing damage to the indigenous flora and fauna. Study of integrated waste water treatment. Wastewater, including sewage, can be treated in an integrated manner by utilizing a mix of artificial and natural processes. An example of such an initiative is the town of Arcata, situated along the northern coast of California. Collaborating with biologists from the Humboldt State University, the town's people created an integrated wastewater treatment process within a natural system. The cleaning occurs in two stages. A. The conventional sedimentation, filtering and chlorine treatments are given. After this stage, lots of dangerous pollutants like dissolved heavy metals still remain. To combat this, an innovative approach was taken and B. The biologists developed a series of six connected marshes over 60 hectares of marshland. Appropriate plants, algae, fungi and bacteria were seeded into this area, which neutralized, absorbed and assimilated the pollutants. Hence, as the fresh water flows through the marshes, it gets purified naturally. The marshes also constitute a sanctuary with a high level of biodiversity in the form of fishes, animals and birds that now reside there. The citizens group called the Friends of the Arcata Marsh Foam are responsible for the upkeep and safeguarding of this wonderful project. All this time, we have assumed that removal of the waste requires water, that is creation of the sewage. But what if water is not necessary to dispose of the human waste like excreta? Can you imagine the amount of water that one can save if one didn't have to flush the toilet? Well, this is already a reality. Ecological sanitation is a sustainable system for handling the human excreta using dry composting toilets. This is practical, hygienic, efficient and cost-effective solution to human waste disposal. The key point to note here is that with this composting method, human excreta can be recycled into a resource as natural fertilizer which reduces the need for chemical fertilizers. There are working eco sand toilets in many areas of Kerala and Sri Lanka. Solid waste. Solid waste refers to everything that goes out in trash. Municipal solid waste are waste from homes, office, stores, schools, hospitals, etc. that are collected and disposed by the municipality. The municipal solid waste generally comprises the paper, food waste, plastic, glass, metals, rubber, leather, textile, etc. Burning reduces the volume of the waste, although it is generally not burned to completion and open dumps often serve as the breeding ground for rats and flies. Sanitary landfills were adopted as the substitute for the open burning dumps. In the sanitary landfill, waste are dumped in a depression of the trench after compaction and are covered with dirt every day. If you live in a town or city, do you know where the nearest landfill site is? Landfills are also not really much of the solution since the amount of garbage generation, especially in the metros, has increased so much that these sites are getting filled too. Also, there is danger of seeping of chemicals etc. from these landfills polluting the underground water resources. A solution to all this can only be in human beings becoming more sensitive to these environment issues. All waste that we generate can be categorized into three types. A. Biodegradable. B. Recyclable. And C. The non-biodegradable. 
It is important that all garbage generated is sorted. What can be reused or recycled should be separated out. Our kabadi walas and rag pickers do great job of separation of the materials for recycling. The biodegradable materials can be put into deep pits in the ground and be left for natural breakdown. That leaves only the non-biodegradable to be disposed of. The need to reduce our garbage generation should be in the prime goal. Instead, we are increasing the use of non-biodegradable products. Just pick any ready-made packet of any good quality eatable, say a biscuit packet and study the packaging. Do you see the number of protective layers used? Note that at least one of the layers is of plastic. We have started packaging even our daily use products like milk and water in poly bags. In cities, fruits and vegetables can be bought packed in beautiful polystyrene and plastic packaging. We pay so much and what do we do? Contribute heavily to environmental pollution. State governments across the country are trying to push for reduction in the use of plastics and use of eco-friendly packaging. We can do our bit by carrying cloth or other natural fiber carrying bags when we go to shopping and by refusing the polythene bags. Hospitals generate hazardous waste that contain disinfectants and other harmful chemicals and also pathogenic microorganisms. Such waste also require careful treatment and disposal. The use of incinerators is crucial to disposal of the hospital waste. Irreparable computers and other electronic goods are known as electronic waste e-waste. E-waste are buried in landfills or incinerated. Over half of the e-waste generated in the developed world are exported to developing countries mainly to China, India and Pakistan where metals like copper, iron, silicon, nickel and gold are recovered during the recycling process. Unlike developed countries which have specifically built facilities for recycling of the e-waste, recycling in developing countries often involves manual participation thus exposing the workers to toxic substances present in e-waste. Recycling is the only solution for the treatment of the e-waste provided it is carried out in an environment-friendly manner. Case study of remedy for the plastic waste. A plastic sack manufacturer in Bangalore has managed to find the ideal solution to the ever-increasing problem of accumulating plastic waste. Ahmad Khan, aged 57 years old, has been producing plastic sacks for 20 years. About 8 years ago, he realized that plastic waste was a real problem. Polyblend, a fine powder of the recycled modified plastic, was developed then by his company. This mixture is, mi is mixed with the bitumen that is used to lay the roads. In collaboration with the RV College of Engineering and the Bangalore City Corporation, Ahmad Khan proved that blends of the polyblend and bitumen, when used to lay roads, enhance the bitumen's water repellent properties and help to increase the road life by a factor of 3. The raw material for creating polyblend is any plastic film waste. So against the price of 0 0.40 per kg that rat pickers had been getting for plastic waste, Khan now offers Rs. 6. Using Khan's techniques, by the year 2002, more than 40 kilometers of road in Bangalore has already been laid. At this rate, Khan will soon be running short of plastic waste in Bangalore to produce polyblend. Thanks to innovations like polyblend, we might still avoid being smoothed by plastic waste. Agrochemicals and their effects. In the wake of the green revolution, the use of inorganic fertilizers and pesticides has increased manifold for enhancing the crop production. Pesticides, herbicides, fungicides, etc. are being increasingly used. These incidentally are also toxic to the non-target organisms that are the important components of the soil ecosystem. Do you think these can be biomagnified in the terrestrial ecosystem? We know what the addition of the increasing amounts of the chemical fertilizers can do to aquatic ecosystem via eutrophication. The current problems in agriculture are therefore extremely grave. A study of organic farming. Integrated organic farming is a cyclic zero waste procedure where waste products from one process are cycled in as nutrients for the other processes. This allows the maximum utilization of resource and increase the efficiency of production. Ramesh Chandra Dagar, a farmer in Sonipat, Haryana, is doing just this. He includes beekeeping, dairy management, water harvesting, composting and agriculture in a chain of processes which support each other and allow an extremely economical and sustainable venture. There is no need to use the chemical fertilizers for crops as cattle excreta dung are used as manure. 
Crop waste is used to create compost which can be used as natural fertilizer or can be used to generate natural gas for satisfying the energy needs of the farm. Enthusiastic about spreading information and help on the practice of integrated organic farming, Daga has created the Haryana Kisan Welfare Club with a current membership of 5000 farmers. Radioactive waste. Initially, nuclear energy was hailed as not polluting way for generating electricity. Later on, it was realized that the use of the nuclear energy has two very serious inherent problems. The first is accidental leakage as occurred in the Three Mile Islands and Chernobyl incidents and the second is safe disposal of the radioactive waste. Radiation that is given off by nuclear waste is extremely damaging to organisms because it causes mutation at very high rate. At high doses, nuclear radiation is lethal but at lower doses, it creates various disorders, the most frequent of all being the cancer. Therefore, nuclear waste is an extremely potent pollutant and has to be dealt with utmost caution. It has been recommended that the storage of the nuclear waste after sufficient pretreatment should be done in suitably shielded containers buried within the rocks about 500 meters deep below the earth's surface. However, this method of disposal is meeting the stiff opposition from the public. Why do you think this method of disposal is not agreeable to many people? Greenhouse effect and the global warming. The term greenhouse effect has been derived from a phenomenon that occurs in the greenhouse. Have you ever seen a greenhouse? It looks like a small glass house and is used for growing plants especially during the winter. In a greenhouse, the glass panel lets the light in but does not allow heat to escape. Therefore, the greenhouse warms up very much like inside a car that has been parked in sun for a few hours. The greenhouse effect is a naturally occurring phenomenon that is responsible for heating of the earth's surface and the atmosphere. You would be surprised to know that without the greenhouse effect, average temperature at the surface of earth would have been a chilly minus 18 degrees Celsius rather than the present average of 15 degrees Celsius. In order to understand the greenhouse effect, it is necessary to know the fate of the energy of the sunlight that reaches the outermost atmosphere. Clouds and gases reflect about one-fourth of the incoming solar radiation and absorb some of it, but almost half of the incoming solar radiation falls on Earth's surface heating it, while a small portion is reflected back. Earth's surface re-emits heat in the form of infrared radiation, but part of this does not escape into space as atmospheric gases, example carbon dioxide, methane, etc. absorb a major fraction of it. The molecules of these gases radiate heat energy and a major part of which again comes to Earth's surface thus heating it up once again. This cycle is repeated many a times. The above mentioned gases carbon dioxide and methane are commonly known as greenhouse gases because they are responsible for the greenhouse effect. Increase in the level of the greenhouse gases has led to considerable heating of the earth leading to global warming. During the past century, the temperature of the earth has increased by 0.6 degrees Celsius, most of it during the last three decades. Scientists believe that this rise in temperature is leading to deleterious changes in the environment and resulting in odd climatic changes. Example is the El Nino effect thus leading to increased melting of the polar ice caps as well as of other places like the Himalayan snow caps. Over many years, this will result in a rise in the sea level that can submerge many coastal areas. The total spectrum of the changes that global warming can bring about is a subject that is still under active research. How can we control global warming? The measures include cutting down of the fossil fuel, improving efficiency of the energy usage, reducing deforestation, planting trees and slowing down the growth of human population. International initiatives are also being taken to reduce the emission of the greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. Ozone depletion in the stratosphere. You have earlier studied in the chemistry textbooks of class 11 that about bad ozone formed in the lower atmosphere troposphere that harms the plants and the animals. There is good ozone also. This ozone is found in the upper part of the atmosphere called the stratosphere and it acts as a shield absorbing the ultraviolet radiations from the sun. UV rays are highly injurious to living organisms since DNA and proteins of the living organisms preferentially absorb the UV rays and its high energy breaks the chemical bonds within these molecules. The thickness of the ozone in a column of air from the ground to the top of the atmosphere is measured in terms of the drops and units du. 
Figure for 16.8. Ozone hole is the area above the Antarctica shown in purple color where the ozone layer is the thinnest. Ozone thickness is given in drops in unit. See carefully the scale shown in color violet to red. The ozone hole over Antarctica develops each year between late August and early October. Courtesy NASA. Ozone gas is formed by the action of the UV rays on molecular oxygen and also degraded into molecular oxygen in the stratosphere. There should be a balance between the production and the degradation of the ozone in the stratosphere. Of late, the balance has been disrupted due to the enhancement of the ozone degradation by the chlorofluorocarbon CFCs. CFCs you find wide use as refrigerants. CFCs are discharged in the lower parts of the atmosphere, move upward and reach the stratosphere. In stratosphere, UV rays act on them, releasing the chlorine atoms. Chlorine degrades the ozone, releasing molecular oxygen, with these atoms acting merely as catalyst. Chlorine atoms are not consumed in the reaction. Hence, whatever CFCs are added to the stratosphere, they have permanent and continuing effects on the ozone levels. Although ozone depletion is occurring widely in the stratosphere, the depletion is particularly marked over the Antarctic region. This has resulted in the formation of a large area of thinned ozone layer commonly called as the ozone hole. UV radiation of wavelengths shorter than the UVB are almost completely absorbed by the Earth's atmosphere given that the ozone layer is intact. But UVB damages the DNA and the mutation may occur. It causes aging of skin, damage to the skin cells and various types of skin cancers. In human eye, cornea absorbs the UVB radiation and a high dose of the UVB causes inflammation of the cornea called snow blindness, cataract, etc. Such exposure may permanently damage the cornea. Recognizing the deleterious effect of the ozone depletion on international treaty, an international treaty known as the Montreal Protocol was signed at Montreal, Canada in 1987 and was effective in 1989 to control the emission of ozone depleting substances. Subsequently, many more efforts have been made and protocols have laid down definite roadmaps separately for developed and developing countries for reducing the emission of chlorofluorocarbons and other ozone depleting chemicals. Degradation of improper resource utilization and maintenance the degradation of the natural resources can occur not just by the action of the pollutants but also by improper resource utilization practices. Soil erosion and desertification. The development of the fertile topsoil takes centuries but it can be removed very easily due to the human activities like overcultivation, unrestricted grazing, deforestation and poor irrigation practices resulting in arid patches of land. When large barren patches extended and meet over the time, a desert is created. Internationally, it has been recognized that desertification is a major problem nowadays, particularly due to increased urbanization, waterlogging and soil salinity. Irrigation without proper draining of water leads to waterlogging in the soil. Besides affecting the crops, waterlogging draws salts to the surface of the soil. The salt then is deposited as a thin crust on the land surface or starts collecting at the roots of the plants. This increased salt content is inimical to the growth of the crops and is extremely damaging to agriculture. Waterlogging and soil salinity are some of the problems that have come in the wake of the Green Revolution. Deforestation. Deforestation is the conversion of the forested areas to non-forested ones. According to an estimate, almost 40% of the forest have been lost in the tropics compared to only 1% in the temperate region. The present scenario of deforestation is particularly grim in India. At the beginnings of the 20th century, forests covered about 30% of the land of India. By the end of the century, it shrunk to 21.54%, whereas the National Forest Policy 1988 of India has recommended 33% forest cover for the plains and 67% for the hills. How does deforestation occur? A number of human activities contribute to it. One of the major reasons is the, reasons is the conversion of the forest to the agricultural land so as to feed the growing human population. Trees are axed for timber, firewood, cattle ranching and for several other purposes. Slash and burn agriculture, commonly called as the jhum cultivation in the northeastern states of India, has also contributed to deforestation. In slash and burn agriculture, the farmers cut down the trees of the forest and burn the plant remains. The ash is used as fertilizers and the land is left then used for farming or cattle grazing.
After cultivation, the area is left for several years so as to allow its recovery. The farmers then move on to other areas and repeat this process. In earlier days when Jum's cultivation was in prevalence, enough time gap was given so that the land recovered from the effect of cultivation. With increasing population and, rep and repeated cultivation, this recovery phase is done away with, resulting in deforestation. What are the consequences of deforestation? One of the major effects is enhanced carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere because trees that could hold a lot of carbon in their biomass are lost with deforestation. Deforestation also causes loss of biodiversity due to habitat destruction, disturbs the hydrological cycle, causes soil erosion and may lead to the desertification in extreme cases. Reforestation is the process of restoring a forest that once existed but was removed at some point of time in the past. Reforestation may occur naturally in a deforested area. However, we can speed it up by planting trees with due consideration to biodiversity that earlier existed in that area. Case study of people's participation in conservation of forest. People's participation has a long history in India. In 1731, the king of Jodhpur in Rajasthan asked one of his ministers to arrange wood for constructing a new palace. The ministers and the workers went to a forest near a village inhabited by the Bishnois to cut down the trees. The Bishnoi community is known for its peaceful coexistence with the nature. The effort to cut down the trees by the kings was thwarted by the Bishnois. The Bishnoi women Amrita Devi showed exemplary courage by hugging a tree and daring king's men to cut her before cutting the tree. The tree mattered much more to her than her own life. Sadly, the king's men did not heed to her pleas and cut down the tree along with Amrita Devi. Her three daughters and hundreds of other Bishnois followed her and thus lost their life-saving trees. Nowhere in history we find a commitment of this magnitude when human beings sacrifice their lives for the cause of environment. The government of India has recently instituted the Amrita Devi Bishnoi Wildlife Protection Award for individuals or communities from rural areas that have shown extraordinary courage and dedication in protecting the wildlife. You may have heard of the Chipko movement of the Garhwal Himalayas. In 1974, local women showed enormous bravery in protecting trees from the acts of the contractors by hugging them. People all over the world have acclaimed the Chipko movement. Realizing the significance of participation by the local communities, the government of, Indi of India in 1980s has introduced the concept of Joint Forest Management JFM so as to work closely with the local communities for protecting and managing the forest. In return for the services to the forest, the communities get benefits of various forest products, example fruits, gums, rubber, medicine etc. and thus the forest can be conserved in a sustainable manner. Summary. Major issues relating to environmental pollution and depletion of the valuable natural resources vary in dimension from local, regional to global levels. Air pollution primarily, primarily results in results from burning of the fossil fuel, example coal and petroleum, in industries and in automobiles. They are harmful to humans, animals and plants and therefore must be removed to keep our air clean. Domestic sewage, the most common source of pollution of water bodies, reduces dissolved oxygen but increases the biochemical oxygen demand for receiving water. Domestic sewage is rich in nutrients, especially nitrogen and phosphorus, which cause eutrophication and nuisance, creating algal blooms. Industrial waste water are often rich in toxic chemicals, especially heavy metals and organic compounds. Industrial waste water harm living organisms. Municipal solid waste also create problems and must be disposed of in landfills. Disposal of the hazardous waste like defunct ships, radioactive waste and e-waste requires additional efforts. Soil pollution primarily results from agricultural chemicals, example pesticides and leakage from solid waste deposited over it. Two major environmental issues of global nature are increasing greenhouse effect which is warming earth and depletion of ozone in the stratosphere. Enhanced greenhouse effect is mainly due to the increased emission of the carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide and the CFCs and also due to deforestation. It may drastically change the rainfall pattern, global temperature besides deleteriously affecting the living organisms. Ozone in the stratosphere which protects us from the harmful effects of the ultraviolet radiation is depleting fast due to emission of the CFCs thus increasing the risk of skin cancer, mutation and other disorders. Thank you.